pleased to have a, a very distinguished panel today. Uh, first up will be Scott Boyer. Uh, Mr. Boyer is the Adams Bibby Chair of Free Enterprise and the Chair of Economics and Finance Division at Troy University. He is the Executive Director of Troy University's Manuel H. Johnson Center for Political Economy. He is published widely and most of his work focuses on applied microeconomics, developed development economics, and political economy. His op-eds have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, the Atlanta Journal of Constitution, and he also writes regularly for the Birmingham News, which is Atlanta's largest newspaper. Before coming to Troy University, he was the development chair of economics at Mercer University. He completed his PhD work at George Mason University. Please join me in welcoming Scott Boyer. Thank you all uh, for your attention today, and thanks for being here. It's great to be back in the Midwest. I'm from Michigan originally, so any chance I can take to get back uh, somewhere closer to home is, uh, is quite welcome. Uh, I hope you all have finished your meals, because talking about public pensions um, over lunch is not necessarily the best topic to, uh, to be uh, discussing while trying to choke down your chicken. <laughs> Um, please eat quickly because my first couple minutes will be warm uh, before we get into just how dire the situation is uh, here in Cincinnati uh, and in many other states. Uh, my comments today, <clears throat> which will last about 15, 20 minutes, uh, are really coming from a personal story, a personal experience that I want to share with you uh, to talk about and then generalize from uh, some of the problems we face at the state level. My discussion is going to be more at the 30,000, 33,000 foot level, and then Andrew's going to follow up talking specifically about some of the numbers uh, that we're looking at related to Cincinnati. Uh, I'm a public pensioner uh, in that I'm a participant in the state of Alabama's program. This is something that's new to me. I moved over to Alabama in 2010, and I had been at a private university before that, and I just took for granted that uh, most pension programs were ones that I, I never really was interested in this issue uh, and I took for granted that most pension programs were kind of like you know just putting money into a TIA CREF account because TIA CREF is the standard for professors uh, of course they would just be contributing to TIA CREF it's for teachers right and uh, at Mercer University it was a really wonderful uh, contribution rate it was 10% of whatever I made any money I made, and I thought I was like the richest man since in, richest man in Babylon. If you read that little book, wonderful little finance book, uh, if you just keep contributing 10% your whole life, you become the richest person. And my employer was doing that for me. Okay, I had to contribute nothing. I had to think hardly at all. I just had to like invest in long-term index funds and go. And I got to uh, Alabama. Wonderful job. I love my job. Uh, really believe in what I'm doing. But I learned real quickly that my employer wasn't contributing anything directly to any account of my own. And in fact, I'd have to contribute on my own 7.5%. So whatever my pay is, let's say it's 100,000, they were gonna take 7,500 off of it and put it into this state managed fund. And then in this position of management that I'm also um, uh, in charge of, I'm in, I, I chair a department of 30, uh, I have eight free enterprise scholars that I've hired into a, a, a free market center. Uh, I see the other side of the equation, which is the employer contribution, which is very unpredictable, it's choppy, you never know exactly how much each year the employer is going to have to contribute, but it's in the neighborhood in Alabama of 10 to 12 percent per year that the employer is contributing. So 10 to 12 percent on the employer side of every dollar earned, 7.5 percent of my own money going into this big defined benefit plan. And then if I stay in Alabama long enough, I get really generous payouts. Um, I become vested after 10 years. If I'm there 25 years, I have really strong incentives not to work a day beyond 25 years because I can be guaranteed a 50% payout the rest of my life. So I'm 36 now. If I can just hold on until I'm 50, uh, let's see, three years ago, 58, and then live a really long time, it's going to be a wonderful deal. If you assume that everything works with the numbers and that the numbers uh, are what they are, of course they're not what they are. Uh, I think Andrew Biggs will get into that in great detail in a few minutes. Uh, the numbers are alarming. 
even by official standards in many states, that are absolutely alarming as to how big the unfunded liabilities are. Uh, the, the pension study that you all may have in your hands that I've done for Mercatus focuses on some of the states that are in the worst shape, uh, and then also Alabama, because that's where I'm really vested and really interested in this issue. Uh, state of Illinois, absolute disaster, okay? Uh, state of New Jersey, horrendous. Uh, state of uh, Kentucky, where I've, uh, I've been involved in trying to help them uh, improve their system and fix it, has just had an awful um, run in terms of their defined benefit plans. And if you look at what the problem is, the fundamental problem, uh, there, there are many fundamental problems, but one of the big one is just excessive optimism uh, during the good periods, okay? And then the inability to constrain that. It sounds like our federal government, it sounds like any uh, government entity, in fact, excessive optimism during the good times, and then an inability to address the problem uh, during, during downturns. So the 1990s in Alabama, uh, we had really good returns. We had really generous payouts, additional payouts to people. In New Jersey, they just had like an, an additional 10% that they gave uh, uh, state employees, just because returns were looking really good. Uh, many plans in the late 1990s were fully funded, according to the accounting standards that the public pension programs use. Since they looked fully funded, it looked like a great opportunity to kick a benefit to these plan participants. Okay? In return, lawmakers can stay in office, uh, they look really good to a large group of people. In Alabama, 330,000 people are members of the RSA, Retirement Systems of Alabama. Imagine if you kicked a benefit to them in an election year. So what you see are additional cost of living increases during election years. They, they crank it up a little bit, way above the actual cost of living because the legislature can decide what the cost of living is. Okay, so it may be that we've only had 2% inflation this year, but they give you a 4% COLA for all of the retirees. Imagine what that does when you're going to the voting booth. So you see this again and again in the early 2000s across many different states, really ratcheting up the amount of payments that they make to retirees. You have a great recession, you have a, a very slow, uh, stagnant economy throughout the early 2000s, and boom. Nationally, you have a $1.25 trillion problem. That's the whole nationally when you look at uh, uh, state uh, unfunded liabilities. If you take them at their word on the accounting, the issue is much worse actually. But if you just take them at their word, we have a big hole and a really big problem. So in 2010, when I moved to Alabama, I quickly had this, wow, reaction. Like, I can't believe uh, I'm a member of this, okay? And that I have to do this. You're, you're forced to do it, you have no option, there's no hybrid, nothing else, you have to join the plan. Uh, and uh, it perverts your thinking, it really frustrates you if you understand some basic finance. 10% contributions are really plenty to do really well for you individually throughout your retirement years. They're contributing 18%, 19%, depending on the year total, when you add in my contribution and theirs, and it's still really unpredictable just how much I'm going to get back. What's worse uh, for me is when I look at what they're investing in, uh, in these defined benefit plans. It's not necessarily investments that are going to assure market returns. Uh, many of the investment portfolios are 30 to 40% bonds, okay? If you're invested that heavily in bonds, it's really hard to make 7.5% or 8% returns. If half your portfolio is in bonds, mathematically it gets really hard. What do you have to do with your other 60% to get like a 7.5 to 8% return? You have to just crush market return, which means you need to go really all in in high risk investments. High risk investments don't necessarily uh, uh, mean great things in terms of return. You could get burned really, really bad, okay? High risk, high return, but there's that high risk element, right? Um, if you put your, uh, your money into a few big investments that go south, you're in big trouble with your public pension plans. In many states, there's one other thing that's really um, just insane about what's going on with the defined benefit uh, programs at the public pension level, and that is that they're taking the money from plan participants and they're using it for very specific political ends or for ends that are advancing the state interest. In Alabama, uh, we have the highest fraction or percentage of investment dollars coming in 
that go back into the state of Alabama. So I don't know if anyone's ever visited Alabama, the Robert Trent Jones Golf Course, which is considered like a gem, okay, in our state, has been funded heavily by my retirement dollars. Well, not mine, but people before me, okay? Uh, it's a 396 hole golf course. It's advertised heavily. Uh, it's really impressive if you're a golfer, okay? Our plan director, who's been there 40 years, is a really good golfer, by the way, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kind of a coincidence there. Uh, my, my view uh, is that a uh, public pension plans should be focusing on maximizing return for their plan participants. His view is that we should be putting money back into Alabama's economy because it'll create jobs, it'll attract tourists, it'll multiply and lead to more jobs, perhaps more state employees, which will lead to more pension contributions, yada, 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 all right? The problem with these state investments is that if they're so good, you would think there might be actually a market for golf courses in Alabama that could be serviced by private investment. Uh, we use the public pension plan program in Alabama to attract new businesses. So we have car makers who only have come to the state thanks to retirees throwing in a bunch of dollars. You all may have heard a few months ago, we've attracted the first Airbus um, uh, factory to Mobile, Alabama. Airbus, the very first Airbus plant will be in Mobile, Alabama. Really big news for our state, until you look into the numbers and see that there were state dollars, there were local dollars, and there were really big RSA dollars going into that investment. This isn't unique to Alabama, it happens everywhere. But it's about advancing a particular political interest, and that's what's first and foremost, as opposed to an economic interest, which should really be about highest rate of return. Our program made this turn after the 1987 crash. 1987 in October of 87, almost 25 years ago, or a little more than 25 years ago, stock market crashed 20%. Our plan director, <coughs> David Bronner, said, we're never going to experience something like that again. So what we need to do is insulate ourselves from risk, okay? How do you insulate yourself from risk, according to him? You invest in your state so that you're not exposed to the, the movements of the market. You don't invest in Manhattan, you don't invest in Chicago. He's, he said this, this is like almost verbatim. You don't invest in San Francisco, and good God, you don't invest in international markets. You put a lot more of your money into your state so that you're insulated. This is something he did deliberately throughout the 1980s and 1990s in response to 1987. Well, fast forward to 2008, okay? The financial crisis is a real good test of this approach, okay? Financial crisis happens, we should be insulated and our plan should actually be doing relatively good because he's invested in a bunch of state investments. <clears throat> Lo and behold, we're one of the worst in the country in 2008 in terms of returns. We're in about the eighth percentile nationally. Uh, so we insulated and we focused on economic development in the state for 20 years and we still ended up doing absolutely horribly in, uh, in 2008. So when you look at this, the story of my experience in Alabama is not unique, okay? Uh, many plans are in far worse shape. We're at about a 70% funded ratio, which is good, okay, compared to like Illinois, all right? Uh, our real funding ratio is probably a lot lower. When you have all of these state investments, we own a bunch of land in the state, we own a bunch of timber, it's really hard to value them because we're the owner and it's not clear what market there is for all of this stuff. Okay, so we actually might have a much lower funding ratio. But when you look at the total picture, um, we have problems. Even at 70% funding ratios, there's gonna be people who need to cough up a lot more money. And that's gonna mean either some kind of cut in benefits, some kind of change to the program, okay, or some reform like the one that Cincinnati's entertaining where you move to a model that's maybe 401k, that shift some of these liabilities so that they're not permanent liabilities on taxpayers and instead encourage some kind of accountability and responsibility. So Alabama um, has been moving in this direction a little bit. I've done work on transitions and when you get into that, work on transitioning from what you have to something else, you find that there are actually other cases out there that have worked and that have dealt with a lot of these problems. Uh, the state of Utah actually did this just a couple of years ago, and it's been fairly successful. Uh, people who were in the Utah plan, uh, who are in defined benefit, were given a choice. If they were fairly new, they were given a choice, stick with defined benefit or go defined contribution. 
overwhelmingly, they chose to find contribution. Why would you do that if you're being guaranteed return? Well, I think even public employees are really smart and know a guaranteed return almost is too good to be true. So you'd rather take your dollars and just know that they're yours and have them with you. Another thing is if you have any taste for portability, having your own account is far more valuable than having a defined benefit. My incentives have changed completely by being a pensioner in Alabama now. If I can just make it 10 years, I become vested. And it's totally warped my thinking. I can be absolutely miserable in my job every day, but I'm thinking to myself, I have to make it 10 years. Otherwise, I lose a whole bunch of benefits, okay? I have friends who are like in their 23rd year of employment at Troy. They completely hate their job, completely hate it. But they have to stay a couple more years so that they become fully vested, all right? This is not good from like a labor market standpoint, having completely miserable people in their jobs, all right? If you get to 25 years, you have people who are immediately making calculations that involve, I have to get out of this state, because the benefit just really drops off after that. So all of a sudden you see people looking for work elsewhere. This is what happens when you're in a defined benefit program. It really warps labor markets. And some states have, followed the private sector and realized that this is the direction forward to give people ownership over their retirement accounts. It's good for the employees in the programs. It's good for the employers, okay, namely the state, i.e. taxpayers, okay? And it's really good from a, a, a policy certainty standpoint from the long term. You know each month what you need to contribute to your plan. The employer might need to contribute 8%. 6%, 10%, they can figure that out as to what the appropriate percent is, but being fully funded is a matter of just contributing that same amount each month. It's really, really easy, and we have examples of how to do this. Now the transition, what do you do with the old employees is really the, the, the million dollar question. Do you phase them out? Do you roll them over into 401k? There have been a number of different approaches there, uh, and some of them have worked better than others. The consensus seems to be that if you have a huge funding gap, what you first need to do is just stop what you're doing in the way of defined benefit. Get your new employees into 401k so that you stop that liability continuing to blow up. What you do with the young ones, uh, I think you follow Utah and give them the option. What you do with ones who have been there a while, you've made promises to them that are basically going to be upheld uh, under state law. You've made promises to them, and you're probably going to have to pay them out. But at least in the long run, there's a certain known amount of payout, as opposed to it just growing and growing and growing, which is what we see when we look at the defined benefit universe now. So if you look at my study, there's a few examples. Utah, Michigan, uh, they've gone this route. Uh, Alaska went this route. Uh, it's been bumpy. It's never perfect because it's political. What you're trying to do is overcome a huge bureaucracy of saying, look, you're not actually delivering what we need in the way of security, certainty, and quality. You're telling state and municipal administrators that just this isn't working. And it leads to really bumpy reforms. Uh, but the reforms that we see, especially in Utah, which is the most recent one, do have a lot of promising aspects to them, and it's worth uh, studying them and learning a lot more. The one other place, and I'll finish with this, the one other place to look when trying to understand how to transition is the private sector. You all, many of you are probably in the private sector. They've gone almost completely away from the defined benefit model over the last 30 years. Defined, defined benefit is something they realize they can sustain, and we have many examples of how they did it. The companies that are still providing defined benefit are really in the minority. They're a small number, and many of them are considering making the transition as well. They did it, they survived as companies, and they're probably a good place to look when trying to understand how to do it here and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I don't want to take too much of your time just talking, uh, but I, I have uh, a number of anecdotes and stories uh, about my experiences in Alabama, but also just in studying this issue. For me, it's about my own bottom line. That's why I'm so invested in it. Like, if we can move the needle a little bit in Alabama, it might actually mean that the 20% I'm contributing actually is going to have a return. And that's why I'm, I'm in this, uh, at least for the indefinite run, uh, if not the long run. Thank you all for your attention.